Great. So this is the, uh, the Amherst School Building uh, Net Zero uh, Building <laughs> Subcommittee. Um, and today is uh, August 4th, uh, 2022. And we're going to have a uh, presentation from our design team. Uh, um, and uh, uh, Kathy, I think you have an agenda and maybe we could put that up just to, to quickly let uh, all our guests know what, what topics we're gonna be talking about today. Yes, and Jonathan, just make sure we can do our verbal. Oh, yes, we've got to do our C and be seen um, piece because uh, we're doing Zoom. Yeah, and so I'm just going to do thing do things in in the order I see them with our committee. Um, I am Jonathan Salvan. I am the the chair of the subcommittee. Uh, Kathy, we can. I'm sure we can hear. Hi, Kathy, you can hear you. me. Yeah. yeah. Rupert, can we hear you? And are you there? I yeah. am here. Great. And then Ben Harrington. I am also here. Great. And can everyone see the agenda? I think I pulled it up. Yes, at least okay. I can see it. Um, this is the agenda for today. Uh, we are going to, we've just had our call to order. We're going to review the uh, basis of design, uh, including daylighting, um, and uh, talk a bit about ground source versus uh, air source uh, uh, options for our HVAC system. Um, get an update on the incentives from Eversource. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to a vote on a recommendation to, to recommend to the full committee um, which, uh, which HVAC approach we're going to take. Um, and then we're going to talk about other issues um, and get public comments. Um, and so I guess I will, I will start us or dive us in here and, and probably turn things over to Tim. Uh, to walk through uh, the, the presentation. Okay, uh, just before we start, I see that Margaret and Shelly are in the waiting room participants. Um, <laughs> if they just want to hang out there, that's fine. But uh, no, I'll bring, I'll bring them in. Um, how do I end share? Does anyone know that? Should be a, where the share button is, should, there should be an end share when you're sharing or something like that. Uh, It doesn't have any end share. So let, well, let's hope that I can let the other person share. Okay, now I need to make this bigger. I didn't, so, oh, there it is, way down. Thank you, Jonathan. Yep. There's a little button. <laughs> and participants, attendees. Okay, Margaret. Okay, and Shelly. Hmm. Did not catch everybody or I, I I'm trying to oh Shelly should be coming in. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm in. Can you hear me? This is Margaret. Yep. Yeah. I'm gonna be on mute, but I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Shelly. Okay, we're ready. Great. Um, uh, first, I'd like to introduce, we have a couple of new faces that you haven't seen from Thornton Thomas Eddie before. Uh, Irma, Daylight Specialist, and Ali, maybe you want to introduce yourselves. And say. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Ali Mancheka. I am a Vice President in Sustainability, um, and Irma is in almost are here with us. Great. Um, and then... We already put up the agenda. I just want to say that what we basically intend to discuss is updates that we have since the last meeting. Um, there were some questions that were asked and we'd like to have a discussion. Hopefully we can answer them and then get into daylighting a little bit. Um, I'm going to share my screen and start off with the updates. The first updated slide, um, and we'll probably get back to this a little bit as we talk about um, the energy budget and some of the answers to the question is just an updated version of the uh, total energy consumption for the two options, air source and ground source, with a breakdown by heating, cooling, lighting, and other loads in the building.
um, and then the update that perhaps a lot of people have been waiting for is the revised incentive structure uh, that Eversource has recently approved that significantly increased the ground source heat pump incentive from $600 a ton to $4,500 a ton. Um, with the other incentives for the construction and post occupancy phase, which has to be verified, that brings the total incentive package. If we were, in fact, to uh, go the ground source route and meet the 25 EUI, uh, the total incentives would be 1.6 million. Um, an updated chart that we have seen from last time with the total capital investment for each system um, with the incentives added. Uh, the cost difference between the two options is narrowing uh, significantly, uh, to say the least. And then with the incentive and the changed capital cost, the life cycle projection costs also narrow over the lifetime of the building. Um, so that is a, a fairly brief and quick update. Um, go ahead, Kathy, sorry. Um, did you, I, I just, I, I guess there are only four of us, but I have, a, I have a couple of questions on it. The incentives, as I understand it, are the, uh, the big bucks, um, the construction, the first two, mm -hmm. are if you all submit, you all working with the town, submit a memorandum of understanding and Evansworth has to endorse that they think 25 is likely. Is that correct? I mean, this is, we don't have to have achieved it. They just have to think we can achieve it. Is that for the 1.4 million part of it? There, there is a validation process and I think I can speak to this or Alonzo because they've gone through this floor as a, but there is a, they're involved throughout. Uh, they will view the models. Uh, they will make sure that they believe that the targets are realistic. Um, the first half of the incentives are awarded for design intent and construction. But yes, there is a chunk, the post occupancy, that requires verification. Um, <laughs> if we do not hit the 25 EUI, that incentive may, goes away. And is post occupancy one year? It is one year, I believe, which aligns with um, your bylaw in terms of net zero commissioning and verification. Okay. And then my only other question, it's more, um, I think you have it already, but if we're at, um, if we go to the ground source and 770 KWs is what it's estimated, I think when I took a quick look, that's either at or a little bit below what we're already using in two schools. And it's and could you just, Tim, you don't have to get that now, but I think it's this is an efficient enough system that it's lowering our electrical costs or about the same electrical use, even though it's a lot fewer square feet. Um, it's just something that would be useful for us to know if if that is a statement we'll be able to make? Um, you Well, EUI itself is a energy per square foot. Right. So uh, you, you will be more efficient on a square foot. foot I, know we're more, I know we're much more efficient, but I was thinking we're running two buildings very inefficiently. I'm just thinking, Tim, in terms of explaining why one of the many pluses of the the heat pumps is how efficient they are along with the building. And one of the many detriments of the current buildings is they leak. Um, they have very little insulation. Um, so just it's 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 a I think it's an easy calculation because the schools now have a full year of operating. You know, pro COVID, it wouldn't have been accurate. So mm -hmm. it's just it's a request for not right now. Understood. I need to point out something. It's that uh, it's almost comparing apple to oranges. Your current building does not meet the comfort, not even close to it, or code mandated ventilation requirements. So, yeah. So, so it's 
even worse than what I'm saying. You know, I'm just, we're going to have to, um, we got a question yesterday at MSBA um, just on a facility review on a, this is an expensive building. And the attention was drawn to the site costs, which was a combination of the HVAC system and also what we're doing to the, raise the building and bring the dirt in. Um, but I just think, think we're going to need what you just said, Simone, to create a case on how much better this will be on multiple levels. Um, so, And then just to add to what Simone said, uh, there is the comparison of the efficiency, but also if you use energy costs <clears throat> rather than energy use, um, the disparity between new and existing will spread even further because you're going to be um, producing and getting credit for the electricity that you're producing on site, which will further offset the case. As we discussed before, reducing your utility bills by a very wide margin. Rupert? Thank you. Um, I have a question about the uh, the utility company incentive. Uh, it sounds like we're saying air source heat pump doesn't get the $45,000 per ton. Does it get some other amount per ton? Uh, and my second question is, um, if that's the case, that ground source gets the, a bigger incentive, is that because ground source heat pump is using water to distribute heating and cooling instead of refrigerant? Or is it because of some other reason? Um. Well, there are two parts to that question. The first part is there is an incentive for air source. Uh, you, what you see on this screen, though, requires an EUI of 25, and as modeled, an air source system in the project would not achieve that. And so there would be additional money that have to be spent on bumping up the envelope or uh, various other things that would add to the total costs to get the air source shown on this graphic. There are other Eversource incentives that would get you some money if we chose Airsource. Um, and this is a, a reasonable projection of what that would be. For a building that performs better than baseline, which is essentially energy code or, or stretch code, there is a certain amount of money per square foot that you can get from Eversource, but it's nowhere near um, what you would get for a ground source system. So um, we're not exactly sure that what that would be because we haven't projected it, but it would be in the neighborhood. And, and this is taking the high end of that incentive. So it would be about $80,000 versus 1.6 million. I can help answer the second part of the question. Why is it that the ground source heat pump is, is a little bit better than the air source heat pump? That is just uh, due to the fact that the ground temperature remains constant and it's a little bit warmer during the winter than the air temperature and it's a little bit cooler during the summer than the air temperature. So uh, the efficiency is related to that temperature. And because of that uh, smallest swing in the temperature of the ground with respect to the air, the ground source heat pump is more efficient. Understood, thank you. Um, I guess I do have one other question um, to follow up. Uh, in the past, I think we've been hearing that um, there's some concern about a refrigerant going through the building if we went with air source. And um, uh, my understanding is technology is uh, well on its way, at least in Europe and developing in, in the US for air source water distribution type heat pump systems. Is that something that we might consider or are we really stuck with if it's air source, then it's refrigerant distribution. I, can, can, I don't know if um, I can I can answer a little bit of that question and then uh, someone please you know also feel free to, mm -hmm. to chime in. Um, that is that is correct. There are options with air source heat pump that would have uh, water distribution. They are generally somewhat equally uh, efficient uh, as those ones, but obviously adds the infrastructure of the water park as well. Um, and you know that, that adds to the cost as well. Um, and in the case of VRA for a building of this size, the amount of refrigerant that would be in the, in the lines is generally small 
um, that there is no concern about about that, uh, you know, an extreme refrigerant leak. So Moon, did you want to uh, add that? Yeah. Yeah, only thing I could comment is that if you do use water distribution versus a refrigerant distribution, costs would go up. So uh, we'll probably have a longer payback period uh, than the, if it was based on just refrigeration distribution. Okay. Thank you. Other, other questions from the committee on, on this part? Or the subcommittee, I should say. Nope. If there are no other questions on this part, maybe we can, uh, since this is sort of related, uh, answer some of the questions that were submitted in writing um, and, and uh, give a fuller understanding of, of, of all the issues in general. Yep, that sounds good. Uh, I do not have any specific graphics, but maybe we can uh, cycle through as they're pertinent, but uh, just a few of them in the order. Uh, that they came through. Um, there was a question of the energy budget. Uh, and Jonathan, you were saying as we were starting that you'll have a little more uh, information from the town's point of view on what the requirements are. Uh, and I don't have an answer. I just have the updated slide that you have seen and know that we can break it down, but we are actually turning the question back to you of what is required. and. Another question um, directly related to what we were just talking about is the amount of refrigerant as that differs between air source and ground source. Um, even if that is a small amount in the lines, maybe some of you could talk to um, the estimates that you provided. You need to unmute. Of course, air source heat pump system have much more uh, refrigerant. And I should have better said at least minimum of 850 pounds of refrigerant, and probably more close to 1,000 pounds of refrigerant versus geothermal system will be factory assembled and it will have about 40 pounds. So it's about 1 20th or even uh, of difference. When it comes to number of field refrigerant connections in both alternatives, air source heat pump, uh, we have uh, what's it, uh, estimate approximately 27,000 linear feet of refrigerant piping. And we specify hard drawn pipes. So it comes in 10 foot length. And even if you don't have any elbows, which is not true, you will have about 2,700 field connections. Ground source heat pump will have a zero field refrigerant connections. Um, another question we received was about the basis of design and if we could make any changes uh, now or going forward. And the short answer is yes, basically to anything in the system. Um, I will add the qualification that um, the project funding agreement is set at the end of SD. So large changes in terms of systems, materials, and things like that um, to be fully accounted for in the cost of the project I want to be well on their way by that point. But if uh, we decide that there is a more or higher performing system or a better material, uh, those changes are all on the table throughout the design process. Kathy, you have a question? Yeah, Tim, um, you know, I know we're, we're getting in, you were uh, looking at some variations on cafeteria on the north side, gym on the south side, different, you know, potential floor layouts. If, if you extend one of those, so say the gym, which has a taller ceiling, so you're not really building on top of it, does that substantially, you know, make an L, make a nook um, on it where we've got a pretty rectangular building. 
two part question. Does that substantially raise the cost of the building itself from the way you've estimated? And two, do we get anything back because we potentially have room for solar panels on the roof rather than canopies? So it's a I, I don't have I don't have enough understanding of which changes would be kind of neutral and which changes would be um, I don't want I don't want the cost to go up is <laughs> where I should start. <laughs> so I, I I, I can answer the question generally in, in that design changes and layout changes are, are slightly different than basis of design changes is that basis of design is materials and systems that are applied to the design. But design changes in general, um, the more turn in surface area, the more cost you're going to occur, the more glass you have, the, the higher the skin is going to be. Um, but, and then in terms of PV on the roof, um, by increasing roof area and design and massing of the building such that roof area is not shadowed by other elements of the building, we would be optimizing the area for PV. But all of these decisions will be made with utility and cost in mind because, well, we know how important that is. Okay. The, Kathy, if, if I could add a little to that. The other thing that everyone should bear in mind when we're talking about costs at this point is that the cost estimates that have been done to date uh, would typically have what's called a design contingency in them because we didn't have a true design yet when it comes to floor plan layouts and things like that. And so th there, there should be should be some buffer in the numbers that we've been looking to it to date to account for, you know, Tim's having to pull or prod different parts of the floor plan um, this way or that way, shrink or grow or shrink or grow, you know, glazing areas, you know, so, so there, there is a certain elasticity um, that's expected in the, in the next coming phase. That is absolutely true. Yeah, it was actually pretty substantial. It was like 12%. It was a pretty yeah, big number. It is, it is a big number. Yeah. And, uh, and it needs to be at this stage and it'll shrink as, as Tim develops things and we go from phase to phase. Tim, are there other questions you were you're going to address at this point or should we move on to daylighting or? Uh, there, there are a few more questions. Um, a specific question was, does the basis of a design uh, include an ACH 50 number for uh, essentially asking if the building can be tested for air tightness with a blower door test uh, and we just wanted to respond that no, we do not include that in our specifications for various reasons. Um, the, the, the simplest is it's impractical on a building of this size built by many trades over the time scale of a typical school building project. Uh, by the time the building is tight enough to do a blower door test, um, the building is essentially, the masonry is over the air vapor barrier and you cannot do anything with the knowledge without great expense uh, in terms of going back. So we um, designed with details that we expect to uh, be airtight, right? and then we often test mock-ups to make sure that the installation is performing to the standard of the details and the materials that we have specified. Um, just a few more questions. Um, plug loads and the, the standards that they're designed to in the building, um, whether or not we go for lead or chips, uh, there is a requirement that appliances and some other things uh, meet Energy Star requirements. Um, and so that is baked in. That was a specific question I wanted to answer. Um, and then with that, I think we can have further discussion or we can move on to daylight. Uh, we have a presentation prepared that Armand will walk us through. I guess I will, I will see if, if anyone on the subcommittee has any, any related questions before we move on. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I think we could we can move on and then um, without fully remembering exactly the order of things on the um, uh, the agenda, I think it may, might make sense to pause after uh, the daylighting 
um, piece and and kind of open it up to the to the public comment at that point if we aren't, aren't already there agenda wise because um, I think the uh, the daylighting daylighting piece will be one of of, of interest and, and comment. And Jonathan, the only other thing we want to get to today is if we're ready to vote. And I'm I'm totally agreement with what you just said because we want to, might want to do daylighting because there's a certain wall to window ratio assumed in yeah. in all of the modeling. Yeah. Uh, and so with that, I think I might hand it over to Irma. And do you want to share your screen or should I? I'm, I'm happy to share my screen if that's an option. I can, uh, let's see here, get it going. Yes, she was sharing the screen while also I'm present, uh, getting it into the presentation mode. Um, I do. Okay, I think that's correct. Are you all seeing the title slide there? Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, I uh, just to introduce myself again. I'm um, I'm Irma Chiren. I'm a senior associate um, at Thornton Thomasetti in the with the Boston Sustainability Group, um, and uh, have quite a bit of background experience with daylight modeling, the understanding the value of daylight and views. Um, I've done quite a bit of research um, on the topic in my PhD and in the past, and um, and within our sustainability practice, applying these ideas to, uh, to projects like this one. Um, so what we wanted to share today is just, a, just the, our approach to how we're looking at daylight design um, for this particular project. Daylight design, um, by that I mean both daylight and visual comfort. Um, so starting off with why do, do these matter in schools, particularly in schools, why are we interested in daylight and views? And there's been, you know, there's um, a very broad uh, swath of literature um, that has been that uh, has been published on these topics, um, particularly in school environments, why daylight and views are so critically important to the health and the well being of all the occupants. Um, and in particular, the students in the building. Um, and so just to, to give you a smattering of um, some of the findings that have been shown, and these are just a few of the many findings in this area, we know that um, studying in daylight classrooms leads to better sleep quality and longer sleep time for students. Um, we know that having access to um, spaces with uh, uh, sizable windows, but also with shade controls increases student test results as much as 20%. Um, having access to natural window views uh, impacts how students are able to recover from stressful experiences. And uh, lastly, students tend to uh, be more satisfied and happy in spaces where they have visual access to the outside, in particular to particularly to views to nature. They tend to rate courses higher and perform better on assignments. So we know that uh, daylight and you know, access to windows, visual access to the outside has an Im impacts both the physiological health, the psychological health um, of students and consequently also their performance in schools. So um, these, <clears throat> are, these are sort of the motivating drivers that um, that sort of dry, uh, guide how we approach uh, daylight design in, uh, in school buildings. And so what we know is that we want to bring the light in, we want the sun, we also want the views, we want to have spaces where you can visually connect to the outdoor environment, 
but we want all of that with control. So we want to bring it in, but we want to be, be able to bring it in purposefully in a, in a way that sort of fosters the, the learning environment inside. So when we're talking then about design strategies um, pertaining to daylight, we tend to think in, um, in three different categories. We think about how much daylight we're getting in the spaces. So the question we could ask is how much daylight is distributed throughout the space. But then alongside that, we want to consider how that daylight is coming in and um, is the daylight that's coming in creating glare or uh, moments of discomfort, visual discomfort, um, based on how the light is coming into the space. And then lastly, um, where are their views to the outside? Because we can have windows up top, we can have windows at the bottom, but where um, are the windows in relationship to where um, the occupants are in the space and how does that create visual connections to the outdoors? So those are the, the large sort of overarching um, umbrellas of, of kind of characteristics that we are factors that we think about or thinking about uh, specifically the visual experience in uh, in school buildings. Um, I wanted to also just as a sort of postscript note that there are other considerations. Um, importantly, one of them is thermal comfort and um, in particular having, you know, direct access to daylight or direct light coming into the space tends to impact how we are thermal sensation in the space, in a space um, anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees. And so uh, while that's not where we're focusing this presentation, that is also a consideration that we have um, when we're thinking about bringing natural light into our buildings. So daylight design, these are, the, these are sort of the, the questions and the, the parameters that we're considering. Um, and now to actually design for daylight, we have a number of uh, tools and approaches that we can employ in order to understand how the light is coming in and how it's going to be experienced by the occupants inside. So um, we, have, we use a number of different computational tools that can evaluate how light is coming into the space and how it's being distributed. We can uh, model how you know, the, the light and the dark spaces the, and that contrast, which creates issues with glare. And then we can also model, you know, how much light or how, how much of the outside you can see from a particular place. And associated with these different methods, there's also a, a whole number of different metrics that um, one can use to assess performance in these different uh, categories. Um, and this is not, I'm not gonna go through each of these metrics. Um, this is just to give you an example of what kinds of um, measures we might use to evaluate how much daylight there is, how it's coming in and all of that. Um, and just to say that there's lots of different ways to evaluate the performance of daylight in our spaces. So um, we can, and we think about all of these when we are considering um, the, the design and developing the design, we think about which ones of these methods and, and modeling metric model, modeling approaches is most appropriate. Um, now, if we think about LEED, we have some guiding, you know, ref, uh, you know, the certification systems that can give us some direction with regards to um, understanding performance in these areas. If we think about LEED, <clears throat> LEED particularly, um, you know, picks essentially one metric in each of these buckets. It uses spatial daylight autonomy, annual sunlight exposure, and then direct line of sight. Um, I'm oversimplifying here, but that's just to, to sort of break it down um, into these different categories. Um, and while each of those approaches to understanding the, the performance of daylight in the space gives us some information, um, we really think that none of these in metrics alone is really um, an I, you know, a comprehensive assessment of how uh, we get in how we get daylight in the space. And in fact, um, if we were to break down and sort of look under the hood of how lead is sort of approaching daylight views, we can we can pick it apart a little bit and see why um, both 
spatial daylight autonomy or annual sunlight exposure. Or neither of them is really a perfect measure of daylight or visual comfort for a number of reasons. Um, and in particular, to this project, um, these two metrics tend to make it very difficult to, in fact, meet the, the daylight credits um, from a lead standpoint, because you know, classrooms tend to have deep floor plates. Um, SDA as a metric doesn't really give you credit for all the daylight you're getting in a deep floor plate. Um, and then ASC tends to trigger some uh, requirements for shading, dynamic shading devices that um, are not always feasible in classroom spaces similarly. So I bring this up just to point out that we, um, LEAD is a guiding tool for us, something that we consider. CHIPS is another guiding tool and, and um, we could go into all of the details of either system. Um, and these are things that we consider when we're looking at the daylight, but uh, they're not necessarily, um, they are not the drivers of our design. We're looking at the daylight design holistically, um, thinking about all of the different sort of dynamics of how we experience light in our spaces. And um, sometimes they line up with how LEED uh, measures daylight performance and sometimes they don't. But um, just to push forward here to the last slide. So what we're, what we're really looking at is thinking about all of the different, the whole menu of strategies that we have to bring light into our spaces in a way that both creates well naturally lit spaces, uh, but in a purposeful in a purposeful manner. So in a way that's controlled without creating moments of discomfort uh, or overexposure, uh, so that we can we can make each of, tweak each of the spaces to make them really um, respond to the the learning needs and the occupant needs in in these spaces. And so I'll leave it at that. Um, I just wanted to share sort of how we as a project team are approaching uh, daylight in all of these spaces and um, happy to open up to questions or Tim, if you have further comments or Ale, please chime in. Thanks. Oops, Tim, um, you're muted. There you go. I see that now. I just wanted to tie it back to examples that we have seen and maybe I'm only speaking to Kathy because I think she was the only one that on the tours, but um, uh, some of the elements that are not described about the location of lighting in the room at Sunita Williams, the glass in the classrooms was higher and it allowed light deeper into the space. Uh, the art room at Hastings was south facing and you notice that the shades were down. So um, orientation, location of glass, all of the factors that we are talking about here have uh, very real impacts on the quality of the experience and, and the daylight in the space. And as we design the building and tour some other schools, we'll be able to apply these lessons uh, and, and go back and forth. So I guess I'll open up to the subcommittee and see if uh, if folks have uh, comments or questions. Kathy? Okay, um, this is, Partly on what I saw, Tim, um, in the two schools we just visited, but uh, um, I also walked around the Amherst College campus. They had um, those, uh, I don't know what you would call them, shelves off the top of windows um, on the outside. <clears throat> versus, I don't know what they had inside. So on relative costs, or some of the windows in your pictures were deep set. So I would think, you know, they're getting sunlight, but not it might reduce the glare. So, so relative costs of thinking of where the shades are versus shading outside or some of the Amherst College ones don't go all the way across the top, they go across and down one side. So they're picking it up, you know, probably morning and so that's a question. Then the other is, I can't remember whether it was in both schools, the stairwells were floor to ceiling windows or appeared to be. So you got lots of light coming in. And that must count if we did that in our building. And I think that was in Lexington. If we did that in ours, that does, I think that counts towards your 24% of the envelope is a window. So if you had something less, but still plenty to bring in light, 
would that enable more in classrooms where you felt you might need it those high? And then my third question is in the Sunita Williams one, in at least a few of the classrooms, the highest windows weren't clear glass. They, they had something in them, you know, so light was coming through, but it was not and, and that seemed to be built inside the window. And I don't know what that was. And I don't know whether that was for a light lighting purpose. So since, as you know, I don't know anything about building a building or architecture. I'm, if we wanted more light, you know, where do you have some leeway in what you've already been thinking about um, to make changes? Um. I'm just thinking about how to organize the answer to that uh, uh, multi-part question. But uh, starting with um, the cost of the sunshades and uh, the purpose of them, uh, I will start and uh, probably later I'm going to finish with a better answer. But um, the shades, as you're saying, some are horizontal, some are vertical. And most likely that has to do with the direction of the window. If you're trying to, if it's east-west, you have vertical. And if it's a south-facing window, or wouldn't have it on the north, but um, it, it's, where the sun is coming from. Uh, shades typically on the outside are more expensive than the inside. And on the inside, they're not blocking. They're probably bouncing light up, which requires a high or ceiling, which all of which there's a cost element to all of these things that as we go through and look at them, uh, we will consider. And I don't know if uh, Irma wants to add any to my simple explanation. Uh, I, I'd say that, I mean, it's, as, as Tim was saying, it's, it is primarily the, the, whether the shade is vertical or horizontal depends on how, the, where the sun is, you know, which orientation it is. So are you getting sun from above or are you getting it really low angle sun? And that'll, that'll determine where you want the shade and how you want it. And in some cases, when it's, um, in some cases, what you're trying to do is bounce the light so you don't have direct uh, light coming into the space. Well, in all cases, you're, you're trying to do that. But um, in some cases, the motivation is to prevent uh, discomfort. So those glare issues. So there was an image I showed with really light and dark shadows inside the space. You're trying to mitigate that. And then in other cases, you're trying to bounce light further into the space. So you're trying to distribute the light further into the space. Um, I'll Ale, I'm going to hand it over to you because I know that we've done lots of studies that Ale has led in this realm. And so maybe you have something to add here. Yeah, happy to add. Um, I mean, Ermac and, and, and Tim covered <coughs> almost everything very well. A few things to know are that you could have, they're called these light shelves, I think is what you're referring to. You could have these light shelves in the exterior or in the interior. Um, in the exterior, they definitely help you cut the solar gain as well. Um, in the interior, there are many schools that have them in the interior and some things to consider. Um, and the reason why we don't recommend them very frequently is because you end up having your window broken up into two. And so if you have shades, if at any point you want to have a classroom that is all blacked out, you would need to provide two sets of shades. Not only that, but when the upper set of shades comes down, it rarely goes back up. <laughs> and so you end up having an upper section that ends up being just count contradicting what you originally designed the light shelf for. And so ideally we, we have looked at light shelves extensively. Light shelves, depending on the orientation, bring more or less daylight in. And the key question really is, is whether those light shelves are contributing in any way to also block the direct sunlight. Uh, sometimes we would, in fact, most of the times we want to prioritize exterior systems that, that block as much direct sunlight as possible, because then you don't have the shades down. Ermac presented very well the fact that daylight is important and views are important. And the moment your shades are down, those two are gone. And so our entire design will really we care a lot about daylight, but we care a lot about daylight without direct sunlight or without glare. And so we will be spending a lot of time focused mostly on that and then making sure that daylight penetration is not impacted and ideally enhanced through those methodologies. Um, and just to add what, we've, what we know from <laughs> empirical studies is that 
those shades come down in schools and office buildings. They're, they're modeled. When we design, we model them to be totally dynamic. People are going to open the blinds in the morning, put, put them down. People don't do that. They put them down and then they leave them down. And so um, we want to try to be really deliberate with the, the fixed shading elements and the fixed and the windows, the glazing, so that we're not relying upon someone coming in and, you know, changing the, the blinds or the shades in the space every day. Uh, and then uh, I think I can answer the other parts of the questions. Yes, the glass in the stairs and some of the projects contributes to the overall 20 um, that we're targeting to get the building performed. So a big part of the design process will be setting priorities in terms of where you want that dialogue, whether it's in the classroom, where the kids are most of the day, or, or your illuminating circulation. And that is uh, you know, a very large part of what we will be considering as we are designing. And then the third part, yes, there was um, an interlayer between the glass at a lot of the windows, uh, which the purpose is to diffuse the light coming in because with that much glass high up uh, there, without that diffusion layer, um, you would have a lot of probably uncomfortable light situations, I would imagine, uh, for the result that I described. Uh, I don't know exactly what that product was. We've used similar products and there are a lot on the market, but as we get into the side, we can uh, uh, work that in if it becomes uh, uh, a better way than movable shades to deal with direct light and lighting in exterior windows that are high in a room. Other, other questions from uh, the, the subcommittee? Rupert? Nope, you're, you muted, Rupert. <laughs> yes, you could see my lips moving through my mask. Um, uh, uh, I'm just thinking about uh, school security and, um, you know, I read about uh, reflective glazing so that um, uh, shooters on the outside of the building um, uh, don't have a good visual for what's going on inside. I'm wondering what kind of impact that has on the benefits of the day lighting. Is it, does it supplement? Is it a trade off? How, how do you think about all, all that? Mac, do you have any modeling information on the various films and what they contribute in terms of uh, visual light transmission, um, energy performance? Um, obviously, they're like uh, separate conversations there in terms of security and what the district actually wants, but um, to have a sense of the impact might be germane to this conversation. Yeah, I think I think um, Ale actually has more experience on this topic, um, and so maybe I will hand it over to her. Thanks, uh, Ermac. Yes, so we have, um, we consider reflectivity in most of our projects. Uh, a lot of the times it comes from a, just an architectural intent more than anything. Sometimes it has to do with birds uh, and how do we mitigate uh, bird collisions. Um, the reflectivity you can get on the on your exterior. So what you're describing is a measure that is that has a particular focus, um, if that makes sense. And there would be a way in terms of daylight penetration, there's always ways to combine that strategy with different types of glass and different other types of coating um, to ensure that there is enough daylight. The more you add, it's, it's simple math, right? The amount of light that comes in is the light that was outside minus what was, you know, absorbed, well, very rarely it's absorbed, minus what was reflected, right? And so the higher the reflectivity, oftentimes you have less light. Without getting too technical, the spectrum also matters. And so you could have, you know, it's, it's not as straightforward and I would not be concerned if it's a desire, let me summarize. If higher security using highly reflective glass is a desire, I would not, see that as a huge detriment to daylight, we would figure out a way to, to, you know, to make it work and to ensure that there is a high quality daylight in the space. Your high reflectivity is not going to eliminate the direct sunlight. So you're still going to need either interior shades or exterior shades, right? Um, but I would not, it, they should not be, you know, we'll make them complementary. We'll make them work with one another. 
You want to try to uh, control the percentage of a, a visual light coming in and solar heat gain coming in anyway. So there is there is yeah. mutual benefits there for having some of the light reflect back out. Yeah, if anything, I'll just add very quickly, but I don't think for the amount of glass we're talking about, um, high reflectivity glass has in particular is might just increase our heating gain or heating load a little bit more, right? Because you're reflecting more sun. And so in the winter time, you're not going to be able to capture that. Uh, but I would not worry about that. I don't think it's going to be for the, the range of reflectivity that we're talking about. Um, I would not be concerned that this is going to put us over or under, you know, our, our goals for any UI, from an UI standpoint. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, it made me think of an interrelated. You talked about the comfort level in the classrooms <clears throat> with, when there's thermal gain from sunlight. Does so thinking about our potential HVAC HVAC system. Um, we have a south north facing school, so in the winter time, you would get more of that thermal comfort. Right now, it's, I would call it thermal discomfort on a 95 degree day. <laughs> so, but does the geothermal, the way that air is distributed, allow us to say it's south side. So in the winter time, those classrooms don't, might not I know the way our house works. Certain parts of our house don't need to be heated as much because they're getting sunlight and other parts are really cold because they never get sunlight on the north side. So does it, can, the heating system can be adjusted to that. And, and I'd flip it in the summertime when the south side is super hot, but the north side is, is protected and then how that interacts with glass. So it just made me think of the reflective side of glass. So it's uh, mushing that together, so. Simone. Me mechanical system wise, it's just made for that. So that in the winter time, let's say if you have a south side, it's under the cooling. That's perfect, exactly what geothermal systems made so that it will cool and use that rejected heat to heat the north side. So it's got good uh, heat recovery system. And I, I can add that there's two there's two factors at play here. There's the actual heat. There, so you will have some solar heat gain in the summertime, as you're as you're suggesting, when you um, have a this particularly in the southern facing uh, spaces. Um, so there's the actual added heating in the space or lack thereof in the winter time. But then there's also um, from a thermal <clears throat> sensation standpoint, when you are in the direct sunlight, um, it's not necessarily that the room around you is warmer, but you are going to feel warmer. It's like standing next to a fire, it's it, a fireplace. It's, it's, it's the actual radiation that is making you feel much warmer. So there's, there's also that, that's, a, that's just one more reason why you wanna control the direct sunlight coming into the spaces. Thank you. Tim, I, I have kind of a, a, a kind of timeline question. Today we're discussing this at kind of a high level theory, you know, what are the, how is this going to be approached? Um, you're still kind of working on, on you know, plans and elevations uh, that, um, you know, as the schematic design progresses, uh, which eventually will get presented at, at the, uh, the full building committee. When, when does this level of um, kind of, uh, daylight review happen in the schematic design and, and when would be, we would likely to be talking about this on a more kind of uh, practical basis about the, the actual building that we're going to be uh, building. Uh, absolutely, with visual elements uh, to discuss. Uh, yep. Probably the next meeting will be planned and then the meeting after that will be beginning to discuss facade and fenestration. So within the next two meetings of the full building committee, I would imagine that uh, the principles that we're talking about at a high level, we could uh, apply and compare to drawings and models on the screen. So uh, a couple of weeks. Um, and then just kind of more of a, a comments um, in the in the presentation, I, th I think I got an answer at least to 
why potentially some of the daylighting points on the lead um, list were not initially checked off. Um, is that is that am I correct in that that assumption that because of the the some of the ways that um, lead measures these things uh, and the way schools are designed that there's a little bit of a, a inherent mismatch. That's exactly it. There's a there's a bit of a mismatch. I mean the lead the lead credits for daylight are uh, are constructed for general spaces and classrooms don't necessarily, classrooms have specific needs. And so the metrics that are used um, don't always line up with and don't always reflect how much daylight and the quality of daylight coming into the space. Um, and the other thing I should, that maybe a note because the stairwells came into conversation is spaces like stairwell circulation spaces don't count towards the lead credit. So you might have really amply lit um, hallways and stairwells, but we're looking at only regularly occupied spaces, which is spaces where like classrooms, spaces where people are spending uh, long periods of time. Great. Do we other have other uh, subcommittee member questions or, or could we open this up to uh, public comment? I think we could probably open up to public comment, Kathy, if you can. Okay. Um, no, I, let me get to the right screen. Okay. Um, yes. So we do have, I'm allowing Bruce to talk. Bruce, I believe you are with us. So you can. I think, uh, I think you can hear me. Is that correct? Yes, yes we can yep. hear you, Bruce. Um, uh, I guess I should ask, have I got three minutes or can I have more than three minutes if uh, I please, need it? No, please keep it to three, Bruce, because we're actually you know, unless, um, I mean, you, we can share. Well, I'll, put my, I'll put my hand up again later and you can see whether you want to hear more. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a, I, I thank you for the presentation. It was reassuring. Um, I'm not entirely convinced by the uh, uh, observation about why lead is uh, less uh, valuable because it seems to be associated with metrics not being valuable as much. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 the prospect of looking holistically, I think is good, but it can become a, a, an excuse for dodging metrics and a lot of arm waving associated with, we can do this and that. And, and I've spent so many years uh, being frustrated by people who simply wave their arms about what they're going to do and, and really aren't grounded in, uh, in saying we can, there are measurable objectives. I really want measurable objectives associated with daylighting, measurable objectives associated with daylighting, please. Um, secondly, um, I, I certainly agree with light shells. I, I, I don't particularly think they're valuable in this climate. Uh, and, and it's because we have 51% of our daylight hours uh, in uh, overcast conditions and daylight shelves are really suppress uh, good daylighting, particularly around the perimeter, and, and they don't bounce uh, so much. They're a strategy for the Southwest. Um, so I agree that daylight shelves are not a suitable solution concept, but possibly for a different reason. But please note uh, that we are uh, operating in, a, in, a, in an area where we have uh, slightly more than half of, very slightly more than half of the daylight hours are overcast. Um, the multi, uh, the, the, the reflective glazing uh, question that Rupert asked, I would think that the solution there, uh, at least a solution concept there is it drives the separation of, of higher daylighting glass and lower view windows. And you'd only put it on the view windows, there'd be no point in putting it. So to the, another strategy for getting around that would be, or mitigating that would be to uh, slightly amplify the glade lighting windows and raise them up above a level where that would be a problem and then only put the, uh, the, 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 the glazing lower. Um, uh, shades, um, shades are dynamic elements. Uh, and I think that to the extent that we can avoid dynamic elements, uh, things, and I'm sure Tim will agree and I know Rupert will agree, uh, because, and I've seen this so many times. Uh, these di anything, if you can solve the problems with static elements, please do. Please avoid dynamic elements, moving elements that require power, that break, that require 
uh, maintenance that they don't get. And uh, so anything, anything you can do to eliminate dynamic elements from the design, I think uh, will be uh, a net benefit and Rupert will love you. Um, I, I, uh, I think generally that in the Hastings uh, building at Lexington, there's a little too little glass in the classrooms. I would think we should try for more, I, I, again, uh, measurable daylighting. Will there be a daylight uh, model or some kind of a thing constructed? Um, are you going to be modeling this? I mean, in my day, we built physical models, but nowadays I think electronic models can do an acceptable job. Will an electronic model for daylighting for the classroom? I don't really care about anything else personally. I mean, other people may, but I don't, uh, because I think if we can get the classrooms to be, and if we can get all classrooms, not just some classrooms, but all classrooms, I think I, this is really difficult and I'm asking a lot and I realize that, and I would like this to be better than other schools you've done. Um, not that they're not good, but I want you to do better for us than you've done before, because I want you to be prouder of what you've done for us than what you've done before. And then you can do it for other people after us and be even more proud. And that's probably three minutes and I haven't finished, but I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Um, I, we don't usually typically do this, but I, I think I, it would be worth the, the design, design team comment, commenting on the, the daylight modeling. I, I, I would assume you're going to do daylight modeling. I mean, the conversation we've had today suggests that, but it, it might be good just to get that on the record uh, as, to, as to what the approach there is. Um, we can put that on the record that we will be modeling. It will not be likely the entire building, um, but enough to uh, tell us what's going to happen in the classrooms as they face different directions. And I see Ellen has her hand up, so she'll probably give a more complete answer. Yeah, I'm happy. Bruce, thank you so much. I mean, you're you're spot on on so many things. Um, the I just wanted to give you a little bit more detail with respect to our approach, uh, because we fully agree that quantifying, uh, quantifying and using the right metrics or the right set of metrics to define high quality daylight is very important. Um, if we had another full hour, I'd be happy to, to walk you through other studies we've done. But um, some of the focus we, we take, particularly in schools, have to do with understanding not only daylight penetration, as I mentioned, but glare uh, and direct sunlight. Because we know that any direct sunlight, just as you pointed it out, is going to lead to shades being pulled down and never being pulled back up. And so we've worked, we worked on one school where classrooms had, we had seven different possible orientations for the classrooms, which was already complex and looked at various shading systems. But we also looked at what the impact of the direct sunlight would be on, um, the team was actually open to considering putting the whiteboard on one side or the other of the classroom. And it turns out that if you're on an east orientation, then putting the whiteboard where you're not gonna have direct sunlight or the kids are not gonna have direct sunlight on, in their eyes, um, let me rephrase, choosing where you put the, the whiteboard and in which direction the kids look uh, can already be a design solution to mitigating glare. Because if glare is on the side, you know, coming through the shoulder, direct sunlight is not, it is not as bad that if it's coming directly as if it's coming directly uh, towards um, the children. And so we actually quantified that spatially for every orientation and understood that for various orientations, there were actually you know, there were certain orientations where certain shading strategies just took care of all the glare. There are other orientations where, and, and you'll agree with us, that, you know, east, it's just challenging, okay. you know, straight, the wind is going to, the, the wind, sorry, the sun's going to come straight perpendicular to the glass at some point during the day, at some point during the year. And so we've, we identify when is glare inevitable without the use of interior shades, but we have a very good understanding of when that is. And so that just makes it easier for the team and for everyone to just understand what the conditions are and think about if those shades are going to be deployed, how do we bring them back up? Kathy, do we have another uh, person? No, we don't. But I just, I think what you said, I mean, Bruce was concerned that if we don't have lead as our metrics, do we have metrics? And I think what you've said is we are going to have metrics. And maybe, Tim, um, when you said, uh, within the next few weeks, we've got a meeting on the 12th of full committee of August, a meeting on August 26th, but just come in with 
these are the metrics we're going to be using for daylight. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, I don't know enough to what those might look like, but it sounds like not only you're modeling them, but you're quantifiably setting certain targets. And I think that's I think that would be great. Um, we can do that. Um, I guess I, I want to. Uh, oh. Did, oh, now now two other hands went up, so I'm going yeah. to. And before, before you admit someone, I just want to make sure that the public knows that while we've paused after the um, the daylighting piece, if, if folks have comments on the um, the vote we're going to take in maybe about ten or fifteen minutes on the topic of recommending a uh, HVAC approach, th this would also be the time for those those comments as well. Okay, so we have two other hands up. I'm bringing the first person in, Tony. Hi, thanks, uh, Tony Cunningham, um, Owen Drive. I just wanted to put a plug in for ground source as the preferred HVAC system. Um, it seems like with the updated life cycle cost, uh, it's actually lower uh, than air source and um, the replacement cycle is less frequent and it's further out. So less likely to collide with another of the four major capital projects. And it should push the design team to exceed the 25 EUI target, whereas the air source is um, projected at 31.5. So just a, a plug for ground source. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Kathy, do we have another one? Yeah, yeah I'm getting the next person. Got, got, okay, Maria. Thank you. And th Jonathan, thank you for clarifying that we could comment on that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Um, uh, I also uh, I think that there was a, a great presentation on the, the lighting and I really appreciate the team that's going to be working on it and I have confidence that you guys will will do a great job there. Um, I also want to speak in favor of geothermal um, and doing the ground source heat pump. Uh, fantastic that we've got this additional incentives. I think it was a great idea before that even, but very nice to have the um, the finances there as well. Um, and uh, uh, also keeping us to our goal that, that we set in the beginning to get to that 25 or under um, EUI, uh, I, the the team has uh, done a terrific job there, and I'm also confident in the the engineer that we've got working with Denisco to to get this done. So um, yes, please please um, uh, pitch for ground source heat pump. Thank you, Maria. And there's one more, Jonathan. Yep. Chris, you should unmute Chris. You're you're here, Chris. If you unmute, am I unmuted? You are. Wow. Good. Uh, I'm just going to duplicate the same sentiment, but I will illustrate it by saying that I have an air source heat pump put in in, in 2014, and it has been okay, and it is keeping me cool now. Uh, and it um, it it it's a, it's been a, a a real pleasure to have, but. It has been problematic. It has had uh, chipmunks living in it and had to replace um, large chunks of it, the motherboard a couple of times. Um, it, uh, it, what am I trying to say? Uh, we're going to throw it away and uh, we're going to get a ground source heat pump system because it will have a much better COP and we will be definitely on. Uh, uh, have a surplus uh, on our house after we do that. So it's a better system. We're going we're going to spend fifty six thousand dollars on the thing. There's no return on that, but it's a better way to do things. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Chris. Any other public comment? Uh, Bruce put his hand up again, Jonathan. So I don't know what you want to do time wise. We're at two. We're at 12 after two. I, I think we can give Bruce another another three minutes. Um, and, and then it, assuming that we don't have any other additional public comment, I think we should probably close the public comment period and then move on to a, a, a you know a conversation time for the subcommittee and then a motion and a vote. Okay, Bruce, you're back with us. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, this is about the uh, ground source heat pump uh, question. And I just wanted to, I, I did s send a public comment uh, by email, uh, and I wasn't sure how well that was distributed. 
but basically it links, uh, it, it represents uh, one, another, well, I think, advantage of the ground source system. And that is because we are using uh, uh, cold water uh, distribution and so forth, uh, rather than air distribution. And I'm not sure how much ducting there would be associated with the air source systems, but possibly some and certainly not with the, uh, the, the ground source uh, system. Um, it seems to me, and I discussed this possibility with Rick and with Tim uh, during uh, uh, the tour of the schools that I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, participate in. Um, when you've got uh, that kind of distribution with a ground source heat pump, you've uh, got potentially, I think, uh, much less space being consumed in the ceiling plenums, and therefore, theoretically, that the ceiling could be raised or tilted, and that theoretically, then, you could get uh, more exterior uh, uh, wall area in the classroom available for daylighting, more and higher daylighting. Um, this is my thoughts uh, discussed with the team, but uh, it's not. I'm not reflecting what the design team are intending to do. I'm reflecting what I think is a potential advantage and, and possibility that's associated with ground sourced heat pumps. So I, for we've had many other reasons that have already been submitted associated with refrigerants, associated with footprint, associated with noise, associated with, I went through the whole list now, but this is one more reason why I think uh, the, the, uh, the project could benefit from uh, that technology. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. That, that's it, Jonathan. Okay. Well, I will close the, the public, public comment period um, and then open it up to uh, subcommittee members to either make, make a motion or, or uh, reflect the, um, their thoughts on, on this choice of, of recommending something to the broader committee. Rupert? Oh, you're muted. I love the opportunity to reflect out loud for just a moment. Um, Indeed. Uh, uh, oh, all right, a couple moments. Um, because because I have some internal conflicts. Um, on the one hand, uh, I think uh, whatever system requires less replacement over the lifetime of the building, that's better for whoever's sitting in my chair down the road. Uh, fewer of those projects, uh, more manageable, control the building. Um, and I do like the idea of the, um, uh, the more efficient system that just appeals in general. At the same time, uh, it's my understanding that uh, even with the rebates, the ground source system has uh, both higher initial cost and higher lifetime costs. Uh, and I remain very concerned about uh, traffic and access issues which have not been resolved. And I'm very concerned about getting public support for the amount of money that we're asking. Um, so I'm sort, of, I'm sort of divided and I just wanted to share that and uh, you know, see if other folks have insights that will help me uh, figure out what I, what I decide. I, I'm going to go last. Um, so, Kathy or Ben, if you if you want to uh, go ahead, I'm, Kathy. Maybe Tim can put the charts up again. But I think the, yes. that bigger incentive, Rupert, just narrowed the differential, the initial to. I'm not going to say just, but I will use the word four hundred thousand dollars or slightly less. So instead of a, you know, one and a half million or two million, we're we're at we're at less, um, and that is contingent on us getting that. And so the the life cycle, Tim, were they equal or is ground source less in life cycle now? That's what I wasn't sure of on life Correct. cycle. Ground source is less now. Oh, hold on. So ground source is less over the lifetime. So two things happened with this incentive. One, the in, which isn't surprising since the initial cost went down and the replacement. So we it can be arguing that we've picked of the electric systems that we have to choose. We've picked the one that 
is both more efficient in terms of the electrical will be better for the way the air feels in the school. Um, you know, the, I think even the heat, and then Bruce pointed out a couple other potentials. And, you know, Bruce, Bruce sent, you sent your public comments. I think you might've just sent them to Jonathan and me. If you want them general or public, I'll post them, um, you know, just on your other observations. But we had a nice graphic two weeks ago from, from Thornton Tomasetti on a long list of quieter and other pieces on uh, what this does for the children. Um, so I, I think they're, because the costs are now so much closer. Um, so if we need to find another $400,000 somewhere else in the building costs, that would be really nice. So, but for of the electric, this looks to me like the better investment. Um, because we can't, it sounds like without spending a lot more in the building, we can't hit 25 with air source. Um, so, and I don't want to see the building get more expensive. So I, I guess I'll just stop there. And Tim, the, I did have one question. The, the plan on the wells, you're going to be doing the wells really soon, right? And, you know, if this gets the green light. So does that does it add to the timeline of the building at all um, or or not? Um, so assuming a decision today, we would release um, the test bore, which would give us information on how well we could expect uh, each geothermal well, which would give us a revised size for the total system. Um, these incentives are based on a certain size system, 280 tons of cooling. Um, there should not be large variation, but if we find that wells are performing better or worse than we would expect, that number would go up and down. The total capital cost would go up and down, as would the incentives. So um, as with all of these numbers, these are educated guesses that are the best we can do at this point, but they will all be refined and narrowed in and be more accurate as we progress. But um, and as in terms of the impact on the overall building schedule with a with the decision imminent, no, it, uh, we are on schedule for, if that answers your question. Yeah, and Shelly, do you have any comments, uh, you, you know, give you an opportunity as we're moving toward to make a recommendation from- Yeah. What, yeah. I mean, I I personally would lean towards geothermal. I think that that, that price difference at this, you know, for the scale of building and the overall budget is pretty minimal. Um, and I, you know, my sense about geothermal systems, I mean, not only is it more efficient, but I just think that it's less finicky over time, less moving parts, less connections, you know, uh, I think all those things add up to it. It's a good investment. So I, you know, that's, that's my advice. And I think that, that these guys have done their due diligence. So that's my sense on that. And then in terms of daylighting, I think they're right on par with everything that needs to happen and, and the considerations and you know the daylight modeling will inform what's the best solution and you know until that's that's done you know as the design progresses we'll know more about that and then there'll be more time to kind of comment all right well is it this option versus that option based on real metrics you know that come from the daylight modeling so i think these guys are right on i think they're doing well and i you know um i would go geothermal thank you Sure. Uh, ben, do you do you want to to uh, to make comment or or have have a question? Um, yeah, I, I just have like yep. kind of like a brief comment, just just based on what I've seen here so far. Like the the need for less or or less of a need for the photovoltaics that that are involved with geothermal. I don't know. The, overall, it just seems a lot more efficient, and I I, I probably lean towards geothermal personally. Also, in in from my day job perspective, the the uh, yeah. the, the decreased um, need for maintenance is also an incentive for me, and the incentive, the financial incentive is an incentive. Tim, I have one one last question, or it's more in the way of a reminder. Um, in the the cost that the most current cost estimating, what was carried as I believe this is a geothermal was carried as the as the basis. So, in a way, we, we shouldn't think of this necessarily as an addition of of four hundred thousand dollars, but that there would be some theoretical savings of 400,000 if we if we didn't go with geothermal that would probably get eaten up somewhere else but 
That is correct. The structure of the estimate was that geothermal was the base and there was a deduct alternate for uh, air source heat. Um, so, so it actually, Tim, if I restate that, it's it's a reduction of 1.6 million. I if it well, let me take the 200,000 that are the post occupancy. It's a reduction of 1.2 million on the construction costs, correct? You would get a 1.6 million dollar credit from the utility that you would it, that you would apply to the construction costs. Yes, I mean you would you wouldn't include that, but you know, it's a fungible asset that you would then apply to the construction costs. The short answer is yes. So I guess my comment would be that while while there is a some you know it's somewhat more expensive, um, I think the incentives really make it hard to not choose it given the efficiency, the quietness of the system, um, you know, the, uh, the longevity of the system. Um, I, I, I'm, I am personally favoring the, the, the geothermal approach. Uh, Rupert. Ha, I unmuted first this time. <laughs> um, I would like to make a motion that the net zero building subcommittee recommend to the school building committee uh, that we adopt the geothermal model for the HVAC system. Do I have a second? Kathy seconds. Um, does anyone want to comment uh, or shall we go to a vote? I will take that as no comment. And so I'll just uh, ask people in the order I see them on my screen. And since Kathy's at the top. Yes. And Ben? Yes. Rupert? Yes. And I am also a yes. So that's a <laughs> unanimous recommendation. And Jonathan, on behalf of our committee, can you write a paragraph worth that to go with that? Yes. Recommendation, and then yep. we can just attach. Then we can attach these charts. So yep. you know, um, and I would, we might. Um, I figured out a way to take their PDFs apart to individual charts, but I thought a couple of the charts from last time that showed you why geothermal all its pluses. You know, the graphic we could just attach it to your yep. note, sure. so that people don't have to look at the whole presentation. And, and we are happy to reassemble in any way that you. Uh, show desire so don't 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 hesitate to ask okay um do remind me kathy i do we have anything else on our calendar for today no we don't have anything else for today the the full committee meets on the 12th which is a week from tomorrow and then there's a scheduled meeting on the 26th so this this will be reported up um and I must say, I, I do want to say Imac and uh, I'll do her full name, Alexandra or Ali. I thought your presentation was terrific. Um, so I, you know, just on a, why we want to think about daylighting. So I, uh, I think we'll put it in the packet for the full committee. Um, this video will be available. And, um, but I thought the words that went with it were really Good. So maybe when we come back, Tim, to the actual what you're going to recommend it, having them come on for the full committee to just talk about why this emphasis and why we ended up going the way we did, it would be it would be good for the larger group with the teachers to hear as well. So Absolutely. we so we can just figure out what the timing of that is. And we don't have any other meetings of this subgroup. Um, so you would have to signal um, basis of design. Jonathan, I'm just thinking of, there are things that people were asking about insulation or what goes underneath the building or things that had to do with sustainability as the topic. Um, if that's full committee or subcommittee, I think it's just- we, I, I was we, thinking that we probably should have a, a, a meeting that, that discusses the energy budget. Um, I think that would be a, a valuable, um, probable next meeting if 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 Tim agrees, because um, there has been a, a some you know thinking in the background um, about that, um, and I think it would be a worth a, a public conversation about it. 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that would be appropriate. And you mentioned that this might be a overall sustainability group. Uh, and I, I think that there are certainly uh, big chunks of things that would be appropriate to chew on in a group like this, rather than the, uh, the committee as a whole before a recommendation is made. Rupert, did you have something to say? I just, uh, topics to add to the agenda. Uh, one of the concerns that I think we all have on the subcommittee is uh, how do we educate the building users to yes. use the building sustainably? And I think uh, some brainstorming and discussion of various approaches might be valuable at this level uh, to then bring forward. But um, that's up to Jonathan and Kathy how to proceed with that. No, I, I would I would heartily ag agree with that. Um, I, I have a suspicion that it's a topic that we should return to again and again until the uh, until the building is open. Um, but that, that's my personal perspective. <laughs> I would say again and again, even after the building. Well, yes, <laughs> true. With that, Kathy, I think I'm going to adjourn us for today. Um, and so uh, thank you. This has been the, the Net Zero Subcommittee for the, the Amherst School Building Committee and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you all very much. Thanks team. Thanks everyone. We're adjourned. Thank you.